Good afternoon. It is Wednesday, July 27th. This is Raven Dana, and welcome to class four, the final class of listening to the trees. It's hard to believe that the month has flown by, but it has, and um, here's our last class. I'm letting you know that uh, there will be some bonus meditations that will go up after the class, and um, I, welcome, I, I, I welcome all of your feedback. Anything that you like, anything that you'd like to see more of, I might do. I might do something else in the fall uh, along these lines. I really enjoyed this program. Okay, let's talk today about the trees again. So, trees appeared 380 million years ago. 380 million years ago, right? And when they began to rise, they completely changed the atmosphere. They began to take out much of the carbon dioxide and replace some of that carbon dioxide, of course, with oxygen because trees are essentially the lungs of the earth. Now, when that started happening, the oxygen level of the planet was different than it is today. It was about 35, 34%, 34% or so oxygen compared to today where we have about 21% oxygen. Now. What that meant, what that means to us, is simply that back in that time, the insects were really big. I mean, there were some other changes, but uh, at 34% oxygen, you could have dragonflies with 27-inch wings span, like, I mean, you know, 27 inches big. You could have uh, centipedes that were three feet long. So now, with 21% oxygen, our insects max out at about six inches, which I don't know about you, but that makes me kind of happy. I suppose we'd be used to it if we grew up with it, but I'll pass on that, thanks. Anyway, our relationship with trees is ancient because they enabled the atmosphere to change in a way that allowed mammals, and of course eventually us humans, to exist on the planet. Um, we relied on trees for many different things. Back when we were, uh, you know, before, be even before we discovered fire, right? We use trees not just for food, but also to climb so that we can see into the distance. We could see what was coming. We could see over the next hill. We could see herds. We could see our prey. So trees were very, and c continue to be very important to humans. Now eventually, when we did discover fire, of course, trees supply firewood. And that's something that, if you don't already know this, it was the actual cooking of our food that enabled us to evolve in a way that gave us the big brains that we have. So we can even say that trees are responsible for the course of our evolution by virtue of the fact that their wood provided us with fuel that we use to cook our food. Cooking the food killed pathogens and parasites so it meant that we hunted and sat around eating less and that the, the food that was cooked, not only did it kill the bad things, but it also unlocked nutrients. So we were able to have uh, more nutrient density in our meals, which made all the difference in the world uh, to our big brains. Uh, in the book, The Heartbeat of Trees by Wallabin, uh, which by the way, uh, it sounds like a great book, but it's... Um, I don't recommend it only because it's very windy and twisty and convoluted and he doesn't speak in a way that's clear and direct and to the point which, um, anyway, it wasn't my cup of tea even though there is some great information in there. But, and, this is, and this came from the, the book, which I do really like. Tree roots feel, they taste, they make decisions about where to go. They have the ability to navigate around obstacles effortlessly. Trees even sleep. Birch and oak have been studied, and they relax their branches at night, and those, those branches drop as much as four inches. So they're known to have rest periods. Other species of trees have cycles like that even during the day, maybe every four to six hours. We might say they nap. What we know is they relax. They, they let their, uh, literally, let their branches droop and let their uh, processes slow down, just like we do in sleep. So, um, 
they can be thought of uh, when trees relax their branches and then lift them back up. That, that can be thought of as a very slow heartbeat because that action pumps or moves the water, which is akin to the blood in humans, through the tree. Um, in fact, here's another interesting thing from this book about trees, that the leaves of many trees and some plants also have specialized cells on them that are uh, transparent in a way and, they sh and they're shaped like lenses, which means that these outer ed uh, the outer shells of the leaves actually focus light. Now, nature doesn't do things by happenstance. So what we've come to discover, or what science has finally come to discover, is that plants and trees can see. Not ex obviously not in the same way that we can, but they do see and they actually can see wavelengths in the spectrum that our eyes cannot see. So again, it's something we don't think about, but it's true. So um, I, I just think that's fascinating and, and wonderful. So, it, you know, this is not something that nature does per se making sugar. This is something nature does because trees can see. So it's, it, it brings a whole different spin into the conversation about plants and trees, right? Um, now, here's a quote from the author. Accepting the recent insights about self-awareness of plants and trees meets with huge resistance in the conservative scientific communities. Many people are terrified about the consequences of their worldview changing when so many well-documented discoveries are still dismissed as fantasy, but that's changing. All right. So... Largely, science knows these things to be true, and yet, just like saying that the Earth is round, took quite a while to catch on because people didn't want to believe it, wrecked their worldview, made things difficult that weren't difficult before, and just in uh, how, how and where we are inside uh, life itself, and certainly that's true about trees. Imagine waking up to everybody you know waking up tomorrow having an awareness that trees are sentient living beings you know what happens when we clear cut an area what happens when we build more condos what happens when we randomly take down a tree in our yard because we think it's in the way we're killing somebody essentially and they're feeling it and all of the other trees in the area are knowing and feeling that as well so this is a game changer. This science that's proving the sentience of trees is actually changing uh, our worldview, and for the better. It's restoring us, I believe, back you know, to the more connected, more aware, self-aware in a brand new way, self-aware as part of us, us being actually woven into nature, rather than somehow separate from and above or better than, which is, you know, what unfortunately most people have this story about how humans are superior to and caretakers of nature, which is, you know, a joke really, because nature takes care of us. It, it really doesn't go the other way around. So um, there's that. We know the trees have senses just like we do. In fact, they have more senses than we have. Plants, too, can see, taste, touch, and more. They have sensory abilities uh, that often exceed ours because they operate, like I said, in different, uh, broader spectrum of range of frequencies than uh, human abilities. Trees have senses that we lack. They can, they can instantly detect changes in gravity, for example, and that's something that we don't do. They can see parts of the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic spectrum such as infrared and ultraviolet that we can't see with the naked eye. Um, so just take that in for a moment before we continue. Just like take a breath and take that in for a moment. It's fascinating. Tree worship. Let's think about, I'm going to change channels away from science for just a split second here. Trees were always considered sacred, you know, to, to early humans. Trees were acknowledged as uh, not just the providers of good things, but also the holders of knowledge. 
and under the trees, especially certain groves of trees, many meetings took place because that sacred circle, the grove of trees, was considered to be an energy area, a place where we could extend and expand our own skills and abilities. And so trees uh, were often worshipped. Um, they were venerated and attended to, which is, of course, different than what we have today. Um, the trees served, and still do serve, actually, as sacred sites. Uh, for places for discussion, for ritual, for celebration, and uh, even in some cases for sacrifice, for animal sacrifice. Uh, the, uh, what you want to know, too, is that, you know, how that shifted or how that changed is, again, what happens in all around the world when a place is conquered and the new religion comes in and takes over. Uh, when Christianity came through a lot of these old cultures, they... Uh, they tore down the groves, they cut all the trees down, and then would build a chapel out of the wood from the trees from the sacred grove, so that when worshipers came uh, for celebration days, for changes of the season, for different uh, celebrations and events, they would show up and there would be no grove of trees, but there would be a chapel. And what they were met with was an invitation, and I'll use the word lightly, uh, an invitation to convert to the new religion but of course, if you didn't convert, what you got was not sent away, but killed. So, it, like I said, it wasn't exactly an invitation. And in spite of all that, uh, our connection with trees has managed to sus be sustained and survive that onslaught, that terrible onslaught. Many practices have stayed alive. The Celts are also known for something called Clutie wells, which is a well that's close to a sacred tree. And so the practice there, and you may have even seen these, they're, they're still in the countryside in, in the United States, we see them in the South particularly, that a tree will have bits of cloth, you know, bits of fabric and sometimes ribbons tied all over the branches. Well, each bit of cloth in each ribbon is like a, a wish, a prayer. Um, these trees were used specifically for healing, that the, the trees were tied, tied with uh, the clothing or scraps of clothing from the sick person and the sickness would then be uh, washed away in the, in the wind and the rain and the healing energy would come from the tree. So that's, that's one of the many practices that has been maintained through the years. Oaks and beaches, pine and adder, are all, all of these release um, sim some similar compounds into the air. Uh, this is one method of communication among the trees, is their chemical messengers. And when we breathe in those substances, we relax. Our blood pressure is reduced, inflammation decreases, pain is reduced, and our immunity is boosted. So this is another reason why the groves were sacred and really are still sacred. There are places where we can go where we are changed, we are physio physiologically enhanced when we are in the grove of trees. The compounds that they produce interface with our system in such a way that we receive all kinds of benefits. And this was well known and recognized uh, by our ancestors. And this is why when people uh, had a hard time in life, when there was hardships, when there was depression, they went to the woods. They went to the woods and sat among the trees and got restored, got brought back to themselves, were healed. I can remember years ago, uh, I was maybe in my, I want to say late 20s, early 30s, and I was going through some stuff and having a really hard time. And what I did every day, not because I was consciously aware of what I'm telling you today, but because of a deep need in me, I would go and lie down under the trees. Sometimes I would lie there for an hour. And this is how I would come back to myself. This is how I would, this is where I would go to meditate. I would meditate lying flat on the ground under trees. And I'm telling you, without doing that, I don't know where I'd be today because I went through some stuff. And that practice, above all the other things that I've ever, ever learned, and I've learned a lot of stuff about stress management, but that one practice really, really made an enormous difference. 
it took me from a place of being upset, frightened, angry, depressed, to being able to go home, uh, to greet my children after school, calm and clear and in the moment and present. Uh, you know, again, without medication. <laughs> so this, I think, is, is a remarkable thing, that we did instinctively, intuitively know these things, and we have, we have forgotten. So I'm reminding you. Uh, now, as long ago as 1956, uh, Boris Tolkien discovered that the air around certain trees, conifers, he was studying conifers, that the air around stands of conifers, uh, especially the young ones, was nearly germ-free. He showed, then he researched what was happening and discovered that the trees produced phytochemicals that were antibiotics. And this protected the conifers from an airborne fungus that often attacked them. Uh, for us, though, what that means is breathing the air in a pine forest uh, helps with asthma, lung issues, allergies, and other respiratory challenges, especially in those of us, like myself, that have some issues with mold and fungus and that sort of thing. So pine and pine forests are particularly good for us. Uh, the phytochemicals also trigger something else. Those same phytochemicals trigger within us a response in our body to produce cancer-fighting cells, to produce cells that um, uh, have anti-cancer properties. Okay, And the benefit of the anti-cancer uh, cell growth uh, actually lasts about a week. The effects to our immune system, as I've said before, last almost a month, about 28 days. And, and that's one, this is one reason that this research done, again, back in 1956, uh, you know, science takes a while to catch up. But now, this is one reason why a thing called forest bathing can actually be prescribed in some, in some countries. Japan was among them. Um, because of the many, many benefits, including the, the mental health benefits, right? So it makes, makes quite a difference. All right. When walking through a forest versus a city, this is another study that was done, by walking, people who are walkers, and when they walk through a city or they walk through a forest, and then different things are um, looked at, examined, this is what was discovered, that the forest walkers had a, a greater lung capacity and a greater elasticity in their arteries but not so much in the city walking group, unless, of course, they were walking in a park under trees, right? So when we just looked at people who walked city streets and we looked at people who walked in the woods, uh, the increase in lung capacity and greater elasticity in arteries was dramatic in those who walked among trees. So again, yet, yet another benefit that we don't hear very much of. Okay. The tree that we're going to talk about and focus on today is our last tree. I'll, send, I'll, I'll do some more uh, little side notes on trees, but I want to focus on the willow tree today, which is my one of my favorite trees. So, in the in the um, in the alphabet, the tree alphabet, the willow is the letter S which stands for Sally, S-A-I-L-I. -S the willow is loved by the Celts, uh, for, especially for its flexible branches. Baskets were often made out of those branches for all different kinds of things, um, for household goods, for carrying food, for storing produce, and even for hens. Baskets made from willow branches were used for hens, uh, so because that way, they would be cool enough, in, and it would help with keep the mites out of their feathers because there would be good circulation. But it would also provide a sheltered space where the hens felt safe to lay their eggs. So um, that was a thing, I, something I didn't know about. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, and it was common also for a willow basket to be left on a doorstep filled with a surprise, basically especially in the spring, to be filled with fruit or with the first butter of the season or with freshly, freshly baked goods. So it was an honor to receive a willow basket, and usually it would be just looked at for a day before anybody took anything out of it. 
and it was uh, a common practice to do that for a neighbor or a friend or a relative to make put a basket together and, and then leave it on their doorstep. I, I love that. I think something I would like to do this year is learn how to make willow baskets. Um, yeah, I definitely want to do that. Don't know where to start, but I'll figure it out. Okay. So the bark of the willow contains mm, salad. I can't say it. It contains a family of chemical compounds known throughout many indigenous cultures for pain relief. So um, many of these compounds are released into the air and much like those of the pine, they're absorbed both by the skin and by the lungs. And in addition to pain relief for things like arthritis, the, the, the feeling of well-being is very well known with these particular willow compounds. Sitting in a willow grove, uh, by, it has been called by the indigenous people, a remedy for loneliness and depression. Uh, there, so the next time you feel like weeping, you might take your troubles to a willow tree, right? But this is, this is a thing that many indigenous cultures, if people were having a hard time, they would send them to the willow grove and they would have them sit among the willows because they knew that in a period of time they would be mentally restored, mentally uplifted. Now again, if you should be on medication, I don't recommend a willow tree, but if you're having a bad day, by all means, go sit under the willow tree and, um, and see what happens because again, the phytochemicals talk to our bodies and they're very, very powerful. So the willow tree, uh, it, you know, it, it also creates that umbrella shape. It gives you this sense of privacy and uh, almost a sense of being held and sheltered by the tree. So, the, so it's a favorite place to play for children because they like to go under those willow branches and go in their own secret world. I like to go under the willow branches and go into my own secret world. So if you don't have the opportunity to do that, drive around a bit and see if you can find a willow that hasn't been hacked back, that whose branches are about touching the ground, and go under there. It's, it's quite a remarkable space of light and shadow, and because of the way the tree moves and shifts, it, it's a... Um, uh, when you're under under the umbrella, under the canopy of a willow tree, it's a much different experience when the branches come down all around you than under a tree where the branches are only above you. So I highly recommend that you go find yourself a willow tree and have a sit and see what happens and just uh, enjoy listening to that tree and, and getting to getting to know the tree, right? Getting to know the tree. All right. Um, even in death, trees are remarkable. As a tree is beginning to die, one of the things that they do is give up their nutrients. And they can selectively give up their nutrients to their relatives, to their saplings, to trees in, in their uh, community that are perhaps not doing well. And then when the tree finally does fall, uh, it hosts about half the species in the forest in one way or another. Um, m many insects live off the tree. I mean, they, you know, they eat it. They eat the, dead, the rotting tree. And a lot of animals will live in the tree, under the tree, burrow. Eventually, as that tree disintegrates, it, it becomes soil, right? So the tree itself, even in death, continues to make enormous contributions to those around it, to the other life and insects, and, and, and the earth itself to feed the soil so that the soil can then continue to feed the trees. So this concludes our time in the tree class. And we're going to do a meditation now. So I'll ask you to get yourself in a comfortable position to get relaxed with your back supported. <sighs> and to have a few very slow, very deep breaths. As you breathe, allow yourself to feel the sensations of your breath. Notice the way your whole body rises on the inhale and drifts gently down on the exhale. Relax. 
feel the way you settle down on the surface beneath you. Relax your jaw. Let your shoulders fall away from your ears and soften your belly. Allow your eyes to close as you settle down more and more onto the surface beneath you. Finding that balance point. Finding that small stillness between in-breath and out-breath. Between out-breath and in-breath. Breathing in, you rise to that still point. And breathing out, you drift down to the still point at the bottom of the breath. Relax. As your mind becomes still, images begin to rise around you. And you find yourself following a stream through the woods. And as you walk along its bank, you begin to notice and recognize many different types of trees. There are oaks with their unique leaves and their heavy little acorns. There are maples standing in a little cluster as if they're whispering to each other. You follow the stream and find two huge willow trees, one on each side of the stream, leaning gently towards each other, almost touching their branches hanging low, touching the ground and almost touching the water. You walk under one of them, feeling the pretty, smooth, soft, feathery leaves as you pass your hands along the branches. On the other side as you walk along, Back deeper in the forest, you can see beaches, the whitish skin, the bark that makes them glow in the moonlight, shining gray in the sun. You can see their leaves vibrating in the wind. Again, you can hear them whisper. and you continue following the little stream, noticing the ferns growing on its bank. And here the stream gets very narrow. You can actually make your way across it easily, and so you do. And on the other side of the stream, you find four tall pine trees. And you walk over to them and just look up, realizing how far you have to tilt your head back to see to the tops of these massive pine trees. And the wind shifts and you smell their scent. It's crisp and clear and clean. You breathe it in and you feel your body respond to that aroma. Perhaps you have memories of holidays, of pine boughs, of decorating. And you walk among those trees, moving away from the little stream and deeper into the woods. 
and you can hear the difference as you walk across the pine needles, muted, quiet. And you sit down and just look out, again noticing all the different kinds of trees. And sitting there, you begin to let yourself reach down through the ground, rooting yourself in the earth, feeling your attention and your awareness, root down like roots, mingle with the roots of the trees, travel along the network, the highway, of lichen, the mycelium. You find yourself listening in to the conversations of the trees, to the sharing of nutrients, to the sharing of information. Down deep in the earth, Beneath you, you find your awareness filled with magic and mystery as you listen to the trees. Even as you can hear the whispering of the leaves in the forest with a clearer hearing, you can hear the voice of the trees below the ground. And you can even begin to make out their personalities. Here's the pine trees. I sit near. There's the oaks. Here's the voice of the maples. Ah, that distant voice, there are the beaches. Listen to the voices of the trees. And you notice something else now. You become aware that the trees are aware of you. And for a moment, you feel almost shy. And then you relax and let yourself be known as a friend to the trees, as one who loves the trees. And you can feel their welcome and their warmth rolling right over you. You can feel that welcome as if it rises up from the ground below you and envelops you. And you lean back, feeling grateful, acknowledging these ancient voices of the trees. And in this moment, you let them know, I will be back, I will listen. And with that thought, you bring your attention gently back to your breath. And you begin to breathe your way, breath by breath, back into your body into the moment, into the room in which you rest. Breathing your way back and bringing with you that deep connection to the living earth, to the voices of the trees, and to this deep awareness that anywhere, anytime, you can go listen to the trees again. 
We come all the way back to the moment now, feeling the sensation of your breath in your body, finding that place of connection. You return fully to the moment and allow your eyes to open. And that, my true friends, is your practice. From now until as long as you want to do it, go sit among the trees to listen and to let yourself be known. Thank you for joining me on this journey. This is Raven Dana, and may the trees be with you. Bye now.